Okay, so before we get too far into it, I just want to give you an overview of what we'll be using for tools today. So if you'd like to build along, you can do that. So I have my slab already rolled out. You'll notice that there is no texture in this slab yet. I'm going to show you how we can easily add texture while your slab is on the jig. I've got cornstarch, which is our star player here that's going to keep our slab from sticking to the jig. I've used our optional cutter to cut out the top or the bottom. And then what I did is I cut out another circle here to form the top. So this will be our drinking lid. So the cutter does both the bottom and the top, which is really nice. So I have our rim rounder here, which will help um, for our hand building process and to keep everything around. And then I just have basic studio tools. So I'll be using today um, vinegar slip. I've got our mini shark fin here for the foot. I've got a red rib for smoothing. And then I've got a finishing sponge a scoring tool and a rubber tip um, shaper. And then depending on how you want to do your drinking top, I do have a Kemper hole punch here, but you could use a straw to do that. You could freehand it. There's a lot of different ways to create that, uh, the drinking part of that. So that's what we'll be using today. So we all know and love putting texture in our slabs. And what we usually do is we, um, use like a rolling pin, but sometimes like this guy, I found this at Hobby Lobby and I was just in love with this pattern. I love this kind of sunrise um, pattern here, but if I impress it now, it's pretty tricky to know where it's going to land on my drinking surface. And for example, I don't want to interrupt my seam where my hand will be. So I kind of want to have more control over where my pattern's going to be. So I will show you, you can lay in texture just with a rolling pin like I did for this one, or you can start adding texture and decor while your slab is on your jig. I did bring a couple more examples of other rubber um, stamps. I just tore these right off of the block. You can see it even still has some of the foam on there. So you can use on jig, it's really easy to lay in texture because you've got this rigid form on the inside and you have access to all sides. So it's easy to kind of push these in um, and any kind of stamp will work as long as you can get the curvature on there. I even use a straight stamp if it's small enough. If you've got a stamp that's small enough, you can still get a really good impression like that. So I'm going to let you know how our hand building jig works and then we'll get into the construction of it. So we have here our hand building jig and the neat part and the part that makes this so unique is that it's really lightweight. You have access to both um, sides and we have multiple key positions. So when your, when your clay is on the jig, you'll have your key in the outer position. And then to remove your jig, it gets smaller and you can lock it into a smaller position with the second key position. And that shrinks the mold and makes it really easy to remove. So you won't have issues with this sticking in. You don't have to put any newspaper or any kind of um, cling film or anything like that between the jig and the clay. All you need is a thin layer of cornstarch and you're good to go. So we've got our hand building jig. I'm gonna start in the neutral position here, the outer position. You'll know you're in the right position because it's the widest position and you'll be able to see the key on the outside. So I am going to dust this liberally with cornstarch. This is a really important step. You won't want to skip this. I feel like at this point, at this point, you really can't overdo the cornstarch. I've used quite a bit uh, because I'd rather have a, a mold that doesn't stick versus a little bit of extra cleanup. This will burn off in the kiln, but you'll see by the end because we manipulate it so much and we've got to like wipe our seam and do all that, that you get a fair amount of the cornstarch off. So I just like to make sure all of my edges are covered. If I have a bunch left over, I'll just sweep it off, sweep it off to the side. Okay, so let's go ahead and score our slab. I've cut my bevels in. I'm gonna score my slab on both sides before we start assembling. We started with our slab is 3 eighths of an inch. And then usually after manipulation, I usually roll in texture or something like that, it will get to about a quarter inch. So our jig and the cutter are made to accommodate a quarter inch slab, give or take. There is a lot of wiggle room with it. So if you're not exactly spot on, you can play with it while it's on the jig, but it really um, works well for that quarter inch hand building slab. Okay, so I like to start in this position. I've got my slab in front and then I have my jig right here closest to me. 
I like to line up the seam from the slab to the key of the jig. That way I always know where my seam is. I'm really aware of that. Uh, when I am adding a handle and when we're treating the seam, it's really important to know where you're at that way. So I simply just flip this up and bring it close to my jig here. I'm going to take the layer that's going to be on the bottom, which would be the beveled in layer, and I'm gonna start at the bottom here, and I'm going to start to hug my jig. You'll wanna do this a couple times before you commit, before you slip score and join, because you'll wanna make sure that A, your slab is the right size. If I need to do any adjustments, I can do it here. Um, and then B, you wanna make sure that you're not having too much of a gap starting out. We want it really close to the jig. So this bottom part feels really good. I'm just taking my hands and kind of bringing the clay all the way in up and down. Okay, so that feels good for me. And I'm keeping an eye on the bottom here because sometimes this part stays flared out a little bit. So I am going to go ahead and use my vinegar slip to join um, our seam here. You can use whatever your studio slip is. Water is also um, good. You just wanna make sure whatever you're using isn't really getting in between the clay and the jig. If I got too much of this in between, it would start to create kind of a glue and a seal and we don't wanna do that. So I just let it pop off the jig while I'm doing this part. So I'm just going to slip one side here and I'm going to take it and I'm going to apply pressure. Now from here on out, the beauty of it is because you have the jig here, you can apply really good pressure to that. And I have access to all sides here. So I'm able to get my hands in and then I use kind of this part of my hand to just tack that down. And then you can come in with a dry finger and then I will show you how we can address this bump here that we get sometimes when our seam is too big. So because my jig is double-sided, I have access to both sides here. I can flip this on my table and now I easily have access to this top side and I'm able to come in with a clean dry finger and really tack that down. Okay, and so while I'm down here at the bottom, before I do anything with the seam, I'm going to just smear this seam at the top there, keeping special attention to where this corner meets the bottom, and then making sure that I'm keeping my clay nice and slug, but, snug, but also releasing it from the jig a little bit. I'm going to flip it again, and we're just gonna come through. It's really important at this point that we address this seam here because it can get really bulky and we don't want this to split, especially if we're adding volume. We will not be adding volume to this because we want it to fit a cup holder. But if you wanted to add volume, if you were just making a mug, this seam, if it's not secured uh, tightly enough, it could pop and we don't want that. So I'm gonna go ahead and address the top here. If you have a bump here at the top, which happens, you can use the jig as a guide and I just take my knife, drag it right along the jig and I'm able to get that piece of clay off no problem. All the while keeping my nice cylinder form. Now this is one of my favorite parts. This is another reason why I like to add texture later on because I'm really gonna roll this seam flat. I'm going to take this seam, jig is lightweight. It has a ton of structure on the inside. I can start handling this and not worry about losing my shape here. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to roll it onto the table. I have the camera come down really low and you can see I'll start from the opposite side and I'll start rolling it, rolling the seam flat. And I'll do this a few times until I'm happy with that seam. So as you can see, it's already laying a bunch more flat there, but that's still kind of a big bump. So I'm gonna come through, I'm gonna really rock that seam. This is something I would do as many times as I needed to to make sure that my seam was nice and secure there. And then you're not fighting that big bump. Okay, so because we are rolling the clay, it will thin it out a little bit, so it might separate away from your jig, but that's no problem. You just kind of keep hugging it against. And then the clay has to display somewhere because you are putting pressure on it, so it's going to squeeze out usually to the sides. So you might get a little bit of a bump here again. I'm just gonna take my knife, use my jig as a guide there. And there we go. So I like to accentuate this seam. Everyone has a personal preference. I like to take my shaping tool in here and I just follow the natural curve of that. And I like to enhance that. Whoops, I went a little deep there. 
So I just like to enhance this seam. And then I'm gonna flip it to the bottom here and I'm going to adjust because I went a little deep there. So I wanna make sure that any clay that I pulled up there gets flattened back down. Okay, and then at the end, because this is a taller form, I do plan on putting a handle on here and then my handle will go along. But you can see how nice and thin that looks. And if you come over here to our finished piece, if I can get an aerial shot of that, you can see this is where my seam was. And it's just as thin as the other side, which is nice. So you're not having that peak or that bump thing. Okay, so now comes the fun part. I'm going to lay in some, some texture here. I know my handle will be right here on the right side. So I'm going to take my texture sheet and I'm going to decide, I kind of want it on both sides. So I think I'll do one here on the front and then I'll do one on the opposite side. So I'm going to lay this down, planning out where I'm going to start rolling. So I know that I want it just right before that seam. So I am going to start the seam just before my texture. And then I'm going to take this and my hands can go in both sides. So I kind of use it, looks kind of like a hand warmer. I'm going to take it and I'm going to roll over this texture sheet, adding really slow, steady pressure. Now I might end up pulling the sheet up with it and that would be fine also. But as you can see, I was able to lay in a really beautiful texture there. So I'm going to kind of copy this on the other side. Okay, so I've got my texture there. And this could work, I'm just gonna pull a couple more examples. These texture sheets, so I got this from my local craft store. So I'm able to, if I wanted to, do a different texture there, you could do a combination of textures. You could even use something like a doily here and you could add in texture there. Or if I wanted to just come on this side and add in my own stamps, I could. If I wanted to carve this side, because I do like to hand carve my mugs, I did a little example here with my vine pattern, I could come in and because the jig gives me so much structure, I could do a lot of, surf of surface, uh, surface decoration just holding this jig in hand. So if you want to hand carve, at this point, it would be really easy for you to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and just clean up my texture a little bit. You could, you know, this is something I can do at the end too. So if I wanted to just leave this blank, I could come through here with my rubber rib. I can make sure this is all smooth and pretty and I would be fine with just my sunrise. But I do wanna just put it on the other side just to give you an example of what that would look like. So I'm gonna lay this here. I think it's nice to have different options with texture because sometimes we run into a texture that, you know, we really love, but we don't exactly know how to use it. So this is a really nice option. Okay, so I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. I'm going to gauge where my last pattern stopped, and then I'm going to line it up. And I'm going to, whoops, let me see here. Okay, and then I'm going to apply slow, and steady pressure. And because this is a bigger stamp, I'm able to lay it down to get the texture in there. If it were a smaller stamp, I could just have a piece of foam and I could lay it in. So I have left myself, see this? Do mm -hmm. you see? Okay, can we, what can we do for that? Let's make it bigger, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> so this side, I'm feeling we're kind of missing something here. So I have this little mountain stamp. I'm gonna need a small foam from you. Yeah, because, no, no, because as I'm tipping it on the side, I'm raised, I see how what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. So I need a foam for that. Okay, but we're not gonna do that right now. Okay, so I have a little bit of a gap in my texture here. So I'm actually going to add in, let's see, maybe some mountains. So I'm gonna take this, and remember, because of the jig, I have a lot of inside support. I'm going to just take this stamp, stamp this mountain in, and then if there's spots where I need a little bit more impression, I'll just come back and do that. And then I'm just gonna run this up the seam here. The inside structure gives me a lot of control for this, and because this jig is so lightweight, I can hold it in one hand 
and I could just spend a lot of time hand stamping into this, putting a lot of, it just gives us a lot of extra texture ideas and options, which I really love. So these squishy stamps, I could mount this to a block, but I kind of like that they remain flexible like this. So I love that. I've got some mountains running up the sides. My handle will go there. I've got my sunrise over here. So I'm, I'm really happy with how that's going. So now I have my top seam and my bottom seam addressed. I've got all my texture laid in. Now it's time to remove the jig and add our bottom on. So at this point, I can already tell that, whoops, let me see. I can already tell that this was already, this was sliding around. So I could easily take it out. If I was having trouble removing this, this is where we would switch our key position. So I just wanna show you what we're doing here. So, I'm going to let the bottom key drop out because we're gonna need this whole jig to close in. I'm going to squeeze with my fingers and I'm gonna go down as far as I can. I'm going to lock the key into one of the holes and then snag the next hole. It's a lot easier to do that. And then I'm going to push this down, giving it even pressure. You should not have to bang on the key. If you have to bang on the key, then you're probably hung up. You'll have to flip and make sure that your bottom is closing along with the top. But as you can see, that has now, you can see that gap overhead. See how much room that that gave us. So I can now pull this out comfortably, kind of assess what's going on here. I'll give you an overhead shot so you can see the cylinder we've made. And then I can now use this jig. I'd start my next slab so it was sitting up and then I'd come back and finish up what we're doing here. So I put the jig off to the side. Now my pattern, I have an obvious top and a bottom, so I wanna keep that in mind. So this is my top here. Before I flip, I'm just gonna come in and I'm gonna address the seam while I can reach it. I will come and do more work here. Remember, we're not adding any volume. So we are supporting from the outside and we are merely just smearing that seam shut. I can take my sponge in here, get my hand in. And I'm gonna take a real um, careful amount of time there, making sure this bump here isn't too wide. And then now I'm going to flip this over and we're gonna put the bottom on. I like to put my rim cone right here at the top. That keeps me nice and round and it also gives me a little bit of a banding wheel. So we're gonna do a flip here. If you're not comfortable doing the flip, you can just put your rim cone on the table, take a reverse hold there and then put it right on top. And then I like to make sure it's mostly centered. The rim cone is a really um, sweet little tool here because it keeps our top round and it also gives you a little bit of a banding wheel to work with. So before I apply my bottom, I really wanna take good care to um, address this side seam here. Now, this cylinder, if you have bigger hands or you can't quite get in here, then you're just gonna have to find a tool, maybe your wooden clay knife would get in there nicely. But my, it's just big enough I can get my hand in there, and then I'm really taking care of that seam. And I'm gonna come in with my vinegar slip brush, and I'm going to smooth this out, make it nice and pretty, make sure that join is nice and together. Okay, so we have a nice cylinder here. Remember, I have my bottom cut out from our custom cutter that fit that. So before I do any kind of scoring on the bottom, I'm going to come through and make sure that I'm all lined up. This is also a good chance to taper in this bottom just even a little bit more to make sure that it's gonna fit your cup holder. I'd rather take the bottom in a little bit than have to cut off a bunch of excess clay here at this point. So once I'm spinning, then if you can get a shot of the, band of the rim cone here, the rim cone becomes like a banding wheel for us so I'm able to go round and round and address that all the while keeping my top nice and round. So I feel really good about that. This is like a really hard piece of clay. I wonder if that's gonna be a problem. Okay, so I am going to score the inside here or score the bottom, use my banding function, nice and round, be nice and gentle. It is a taller form, so it, we don't want it to topple over. And then I'm gonna come and score the bottom and I don't know if you noticed on the bottom there, but I did include my maker's mark and I did end up using the same stamp that I used for the side so that the bottom would match. So I've got my maker's mark, I've got my bottom. 
And then we are going to add vinegar and I'm going to add my vinegar slip to the lid so I don't have a lot of liquid flowing back into my cylinder. If you're having issue with, um, issues with cracking, your clay could be um, just not soft enough. You could be using clay that's too hard so it's a little harder to join. Um, also, if you are leaving a lot of moisture in your vessel, especially around your seams, seams and your joints, that can cause a big issue for cracking. So check both those points. So I'm not gonna apply any downward pressure. I'm just gonna make sure that I'm nice and lined up again. And that feels good to me. So now I'm going to take my dry finger here or the pad of my thumb, and I'm going to apply that downward pressure. Now this is just it here at the bottom. We are going to use our banding wheel in a second and then we'll really secure this bottom to the form. We'll get that joined nice and good. All right, so now I have my rim is nice and round. My cylinder is nice straight up and down still. I'm going to grab just a small wear board. I'm gonna put it on the top and then I am going to flip it. Hopefully the rim cone stays in there. We'll see if it flies. Okay, there we go. So bring my banding wheel over. All right, isn't she pretty? Nice and straight up and down form. And then I can go ahead and do a little bit more um, pressure on the bottom here. And because our rim cone is in, I'm not worried about losing my shape up here. And then I'm going to take my finger and we are going to start um, going around and using the, you're on the wrong side. So do you see how now I'm working on this side? Do, do yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So now you're gonna have to come over. Okay. So let's just switch a little angle here so you can see. I cut, you remember when I did that bottom? That was my fault, I cut that wrong. So I don't know about this bottom, but I won't do that next time. Okay, so I'm just gonna take my finger and I'm just bringing the clay, rolling the clay up, making this smooth. Now, I really at this point want to start thinking about what I'm doing with my bottom. I know I like to carve fluting into my bottoms like this. So I know that I need a pretty, probably about half an inch of a flat surface to work on there. So I will take my mini shark fin tool. It is really strong, but also has a little give, which is nice. And I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna start at a less extreme angle. My purpose with this is to take some extra clay off the bottom. So this would be our trimming phase. And then as I roll the shark fin up, it really starts to secure that join there and it fills in our cracks with the extra clay. So I'm going to take this and you can go as deep as you want. You can make your foot as dramatic as you want. What I will tell you at this point, what's important is that the more refined this bottom is, the lighter your vessel will look on, on the table and you're also making it um, lighter to hold because you're removing clay off the bottom. So you are removing some weight. Always keeping in mind what your foot's going to look like and also keeping in mind that this is going to go in a cup holder. So I do want this really nice and narrow at the bottom because we don't want any edges catching when someone's getting in their car. Okay, and if it slides, that's okay. Just reposition. There's nothing the sponge won't fix at the end. And then you can bring this up at a higher angle and this is just going to further compress that and make that seam nice and strong for you. I will come back and fuss for that for my own sake. Um, after we're done here, I would take a little more time for me personally, but we're gonna move on because we don't have, we don't have time for you to sit and watch me fuss over my pot. So now we've got the bottom addressed here and I'm gonna flip it so you can see. Even if I wanted to stop here, look how beautiful that foot is. Nice and narrow, nice and slick. I would take my thumb and a sponge. You can um, address this little curl of clay that you've created down there, that little lip of clay, but you could be done right there. Actually, we could be all the way done here. Just give it a twist of the rim cone. We could be done here, and this would be a perfectly great tumbler, like a summer tumbler, tumbler drinking glass. So you could be done at this point. I would just come in with my sponge and um, make sure that we've addressed our seams, both top and bottom and I'll give you an overhead shot so you can just see how we have kept this cylinder form the whole way through. 
And that's because the jig has given us so much structure from the inside and we have handled it so much. I have flipped this, I have turned it, I have used both ends and we still have a beautiful form here at the top. So we aren't going to stop there. We are going to add our half drinking lid. I use the same mountain stamp that I ran up the side here just to kind of bring some continuity to the design. I think I really want my handle to be right here, right by where these mountains are. Actually, I'll probably plan for the handle right by the seam there. So I am going to, for a right-handed person, put my drinking lip on this side. So always keep in mind if you're gonna do right or left hand, okay? And then before I do any slipping and scoring, I'm going to do the same thing I did with the bottom. We are gonna treat the top just like the foot. And because we put the rim cone in here, it's going to flare just a little bit. So you just have to take your hands and just little by little, small movements, bring it in until you feel like you are at a good point for this drinking lid, okay? Might take a little while. And then once you feel good about where that is, we'll mark it. Let's see. Just bring this guy in just a little bit. All right. Okay, now I'm going to mark where our lid is going to fit. I'm gonna take my rubber tool, or you can use your shark fin, whatever you've got. So one and two, and now I know where I need to score. Okay, so I'm going to take this, and we are going to score this mark to mark. Nice deep grooves here, okay? It's really important that this lid is super secure. We don't want it lifting up. And then I'm going to take this, and I'm gonna start treating my edges under here while it's in my hand and not attached yet. This is a really important part under here because as they're hand washing, if you have any sharp edges, they'll catch it with their fingers or with their sponge. Um, and we don't want that. So I'm just going to come through here and just do some pre-shaping. Okay, some pre-smoothing. And then I'm going to go ahead and score the side nice and deep, keeping mind of that corner. If this lid is going to lift or crack, it will likely be at these two edges where it attaches um, to the mug there. So that looks good. I'm gonna take my vinegar slip again. I'm gonna apply it to the lid side so I'm not dripping a lot of vinegar. And actually, we didn't even do this seam in here. So it's a good thing you guys reminded me. Okay, so deep in there, if you take the camera, you will see that we have um, our inner seam here. I have just a regular studio shaper. As these forms get taller, because we do have two extension options for this, I think this is our tallest one. So you are going to take, you're going to find a tool that you can get down in here to address that seam, and I can do this no problem. I don't have to bump my rim or do anything. I'm just going to go round and round and round and round, make sure that I am sealing that seam in there, and then I'm going to come through with my vinegar brush, put a little bit of water, not a ton, and I'm going to take that and I'm gonna start smoothing. Sorry if my hand's in the way. I'm basically just running it along that inside um, seam, and then I'm gonna take this brush and I'm gonna smooth the bottom. And that's just gonna make your bottom look really nice. We are gonna make sure that we are coming back in here and picking up any extra moisture. You do not want to leave puddles of water down there. Like I said, if you're having splitting or separation issues, whoops, it is likely that you are leaving too much slip at the bottom there. So now our bottom is good, making sure our seam up the side has been addressed. Um, you can see there's not a ton of cornstarch left. Um, whether the, I don't know if the clay absorbs it or the jig takes it, but at this point, I would be comfortable putting this in the kiln. If you wanna come through with a wet brush and get the rest of your cornstarch, you're more than welcome to do that. So now we have our lid ready to go. Just gonna put a little bit more slip on there because I had to set that aside for a second. And then we are just going to match it up on the top. And I'm not committing, I'm not starting to smush down right away. I'm just gonna come and make sure, I'm just a little off center. I'm gonna make sure I'm all matched up. And then I'm gonna support from the outside and I'm going to start pushing this down. Because it's a half lid, we can't really flip this over. We won't get even pressure. So I'm going to rely on my hands for this. So I am pushing from the outside and pushing from the top. 
so I'm not smushing my rim far out of whack there and making sure I'm taking extreme patient care right here with these corners, really tacking that down. Okay, so we have a lot of work to do here to get from this point to this point. We want a really smooth drinking ridge here. We want no cracking. We want a secure join there. We want a really comfortable mouth feel. So that's gonna take a little bit of work. I'm going to do the same thing I did with the bottom. I'm gonna take my finger and I'm going to go and roll around and I'm going to just fill in that crevice with the clay that I'm picking up, okay, supporting. We still have a really nice cylinder shape. And then I like to take my shark fin here and I use the, the, the back of it. And that just get, gives me a really tiny work surface, really rigid, and is much more effective than just my finger because I have more surface area. I'm able to get more and more even surface area. So any clay that you pick up, no problem, just take it off. And then we are going to work this. I like to go until I can't see the seam anymore. This can be a time consuming part. This is, if you are going to take time anywhere, I would recommend that you do it here. This is where you should be taking your extra time because this can really make or break. We just did all this work. And if you're drinking surface, if your lip, um, the rim where your lip is meeting the, uh, the pot is not comfortable, people will not be happy with that. So I'm going to, I would come back through here a little bit more, show you what I'm gonna do with my rubber rib. I'm not gonna do it all on camera for you, but I wanna give you the general sweeping motion here and around, and then I take it and I taco it, and then I start addressing this top part. And I just keep coming back through here. I'll grab one that I just made for you. Here, whoops, oh boy. Okay, so you can see this, I really come through until you can barely even see where it's joined and then nice and smooth over top when I add my three holes. So you'll want to come through. I'm not gonna do it now because it just, that takes a little bit longer. And I wanna leave room for questions. So at this point, if this was all the way smooth to my liking, I would come in and I would just pat this middle part down. This will naturally slump in your glaze fire as is. So I try not to fight that natural function I try to just go with it, and it turns out that if you give it more of a dip like that, it is just more comfortable to uh, drink from. When I was laying in my texture for the top, I gave myself an allowance for my drinking hole here. So I'm going to use, okay. Typically I have my Kemper hole punch here, and I like to put three holes for a hot beverage. But I also want to make something that's good for like an iced coffee or an iced beverage. So I can take something that's like a drinking straw and I'm gonna find my center like this and I'm just gonna eyeball that. And you can take a regular drinking straw, let's see here, and just gently twist it through until you're poked through on the other end. And remember, this hole is going to shrink. So I am gonna come through here, so there's my hole. I don't know how I'm gonna get that clay out of there. <laughs> okay, so there's my preliminary hole. Now I'm going to take my regular studio brush, make sure it's clean. I'm gonna take it down in, I'm gonna pop that little lug of clay that's stuck in there. And I am going to just kind of do a gentle circular motion. What I'm doing is creating a larger hole to account for shrinkage. I want my metal straw to fit in here after it's fired and after it's glazed. So I'm going to increase my hole size there. And then I can come through with my sponge and making sure I'm getting all my sharp edges. Come through with your finger and make sure that you're addressing any sharp edges underneath. Because like I said, when someone is hand washing this, they will snag that. So you wanna make sure it still feels really good underneath. And then this is something that you can fuss more with at Leather Hard also, because the clay is pretty soft still. So there is my drinking hole. This will fit. I'll probably have to get a longer straw. Once it's fired, it will fit like this. And then you have a vessel that you can have an iced coffee or an iced drink like that, and that will um, that will be comfortable for you. 
So there's that, or this could even be fine for a hot beverage too. I think that that would work. Making sure I'm just patting this down, liking that angle. I would let this mug set up. I'd make a few and then I'd come back and I would add my handle on if that is what I'm choosing to do. But as you can see, um, apart from further finishing, I encourage you to come through and just make sure everything's really pretty and everything's really smooth. Make sure all your slip is managed. Make sure your drinking lip is nice and beveled. But as far as construction goes, it's really easy. Because of our jig, I was able to inlay some really amazing texture while I was holding this vessel in hand. As you can see, the sphere is really nice and straight up and down. Um, I like to bring a ruler here at the end so you can see. Probably just come from the side. It will not be perfect. And remember, I tapered in the bottom a little bit but you can see it's really, really close to being completely straight up and down. So if I wanted to leave the bottom narrow and belly out the top, I could. If I wanted to bring the seam in a little bit more, I could do, if you could do all your final adjustments. But that is our extra large travel mug jig there.